Hi, welcome to another video by Fortune Buchholz of NotFortuneSchool.com. So, uh, as you know, um, during the fall I was making a lot of videos about Chiro Marchetti's Fantasiacal Kipper deck. Um, and I had in plan to continue with that, except people said that you know they needed some time over the holidays to stop and work with the three and a half hours of video content I had already made for Chiro's deck. So I stopped that for uh, about three or four weeks, and I made a couple videos just about tarot books and um, talking about important ideas for contemporary tarot, so that people could catch up. Um, but then it came to my attention that you know people were ready for more Kipper content and that a lot of people even though the Chiro Marchetti deck came with a beautiful companion document written by myself as well as Susanna Zitzel um, and of course Stella that they still uh, had a lot of misunderstandings about the cards it seemed that some people were not actually bothering to read the companion document and they were confused about the differences between Chero's interpretation and the standard uh, interpretations or images that you would find on the internet, on the web, or in many popular German books about the Kipper. Uh, so there was a lot of um, email back and forth and some requests that I just go ahead and go through the deck card by card, which I hadn't at first thought was necessary to do because a companion document. Uh, however, you know, I understand that um, maybe not everybody uh, can get through the companion document or maybe people still have questions about the companion document. So I just wanted to go through and look at the cards very briefly, try to go through uh, a few cards in, in a couple of videos and just kind of clarify matters. Um, you know, to help people out uh, who didn't get a chance to read the companion document. I, I won't use the word um, lazy because that's judgmental, but if you do have the Chira deck and you do have the companion document, then I really do suggest that you read it. I know that some people who bought the deck uh, say that their first language is not English and so that they struggle uh, with some of you know, the wording and the vocabulary, and of course, Chiro's deck, even though it's a PDF, it's difficult to put through Google Translate. So I'm just going to go ahead and um, explain it, uh, and I hope that everyone uh, will be patient uh, as I go through sort of these, you know, simplistic explanations. Again, uh, these explanations are particular to Chiro's iconography, to, to Chiro's deck. Um, they do have a lot of general overlay about how I read the Kipper in general. So there is a lot of, I don't, I don't want to say there's a kernel of German truth there, although as you know I like to say there is no one dictator of the Kipper and that card reading is a practice and that everyone should of course feel free to read cards the way they work for them. Um, of course, you know, I think some readings may be more useful or skillful than others, but you, you know, you may disagree. Again, as I always say, you know, if there were a dictator of the Kibber, which there is not, uh, I certainly would not be she. So uh, that said, I'm not going to waste any more time. I'm just going to go ahead and hop in uh, to the first uh, set of cards. Now, in general, uh, I approach the Kibber deck differently than other decks, such as the Lenormand or the Tarot. To me, the Kipper deck is a novel, right? As Chiro says, uh, or has said in the past, a quote-unquote soap opera. Again, that's kind of a derogatory term, but, you know, that's Chiro's sense of, you know, mocking British humor. So I know where that comes from. But, you, you know, in this time period, the Biedermeier period and the period just after sort of what we'd call the classical Weimar period or maybe the, you know, German Romantic period, however, you know, you want to draw your timelines around that. Um, because of course the Kipper deck is made in the, you know, romantic period to look back to the Biedermeier. Um, the, the reading of novels and of farces became extremely popular. So uh, that was a uh, kind of a new turn uh, of events uh, during that time period before uh, people read, you know, Goethe, uh, serious literature, uh, they had started to read fairy tales a little bit, and of course they read a lot of pietistic religious works, right? So the idea that you could read these light-hearted farces, or you could read the development of the model no of the modern novel as it goes into sort of a tragic comic uh, kind of mode, you know, lighter than Goethe, 
uh, not necessarily always spiritual and so heavily philosophical, not always so intensely um, classical or even high romantic, you know, that you could have this sort of in-between bourgeois um, entertainment that still had some redeeming moral value was kind of a new concept for people uh, as you know books became cheaper as printing improved more and more people had books it was very common to go see a play particularly a French play in Germany like the works of uh, Alfred de Musset and then you know buy the book or buy the play and then read it to show how fashionable you were so uh, you know, there's a new level of entertainment, a new level of reading that's available to people, particularly women, right? These cards are pre predominantly the culture of women. So when we talk about um, their history and what they meant in the culture at the time, it's always very important to talk about, you know, women and how women were living at the time. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of my overall orientation is, is I like to look at the Kipper as part of the overall development of the bourgeois German taste for the rising novel. Okay, and so the Kipper has so many people in it, right? Unlike, say, the Lenormand deck, which has many animals and external scenes, uh, the Kipper is much more internal and it's much more human oriented. It's, there are a lot of people in that. And those of you who've seen my video on Chiro's Extra, see why we have so many people in the Kipper deck and how that's a development of previous games, German games, particularly Austrian games, uh, the Lottery de la Masque. Uh, if you have been following my Facebook feed or maybe I'll post it on my new uh, Instagram feed, uh, you can see that there is a particularly beautiful, uh, beautiful, beautiful Austrian game of the highest quality of printing and manufacture uh, from Austria in the 1820s, and it has just packed full with people cards. It has some uh, some cards that seem familiar to those who use the Lenormand a lot. It has a lot of Kipper cards, and it's just packed, packed, packed with people cards, and it shows people of all social classes, right, just as we see in the Kipper deck, a wide range of social classes. So, you know, I always like to, to turn to the Lottery de la Masque and uh, to look at that, um, as I said, go to my feed, uh, either you can search back on my Facebook feed if you're my friend on Facebook, or if not, um, maybe I'll go ahead this evening and, and post a couple of pictures of that up on my Instagram feed. So uh, that aside, you know, understanding that we're taking a novelistic approach, which is not something that a lot of other readers do because they don't have that same uh, cultural and psychological turn that um, I think is so important, um, you're gonna see this kind of discussion appear again and again about each card, okay? So thanks a lot. Now, um, let's go ahead and just get started here. Uh, let's get started with the first card, the main male, the Hauptperson, the central person. We might say in English, the protagonist, the hero, or the gentleman approaching it again as a novel. I know not like not everyone likes the word protagonist. They think it's not quote unquote card language. But again, I know that almost everybody watching this is a highly literate person. Uh, many of you have advanced degrees. Everyone in the card community certainly has a lot of contact and uh, deep uh, thinking uh, with history. Uh, and with literature. So, you know, maybe you don't even have a formal education, but I know that just from being in the card community, you're familiar with these concepts, so I'm just not going to talk down to you, okay? And I hope you appreciate that. I'm very grateful for your positivity and support in that. So, uh, this is the male significator, right? He is the co-protagonist of our novel, as I like to say, right? With the lady card, card number two. As you can see, he's a fine gentleman. Uh, Chiro has drawn him as a Victorian gentleman. He's what the Germans would have called a man of qualities. And you can see he's standing in his study, right? The paintings in the study in Chiro's deck refer to other cards. So it's very important to look very carefully, you know, if you're looking at the cards in this way and see how the pictures, the paintings in his study reflect on the cards in the other deck. Now, uh, I always like to note that, of course, for an opposite sex reading, he's the partner of the lady, Kipper too. But in a same sex reading, I like to have him be the partner of the millionaire or, you know, the rich man, <laughs> Kipper 13. Um, 
Right, and I know some people like to use uh, a different Kipper card for the same-sex partner, uh, Kipper 5, but uh, that, you know, that's just never worked for me, so I just, I use Kipper 13. And your mileage may vary, right? Experiment and see which card works for you. But um, one of the beautiful things about the structure of the Kipper deck is that because it has so many people cards of all social classes and of all ages, it's very accommodating to contemporary social circumstances. And despite the social hierarchy it displays, it's actually not bound in that time, but is very easily made flexible and relevant to uh, contemporary use. And that's a, another really great thing about the Kipper. So let's go ahead and we'll move on to card number two, the lady or the heroine, the Hauptpersonin, as they say in German, card number two, right? She's the female significator. She's our co-protagonist, right? As you can see, she's an elegant lady as Chiro has drawn her. She's in a fine tea dress edged with lace and beading. Uh, and she's wearing her pearls, so we know it's the afternoon, right? She's sitting in what would have been at that time a private sitting room adjacent to her boudoir, right? So in the Victorian time, which Chiro has moved this to, but also in the Biedermeyer time, right, you would have had a formal house with a wide variety of rooms, right? Some rooms would have been for you know, formal visiting, they would have been a formal parlor, you would have had a drawing room or a family room or a living room, then you would have had like a, a series of private sitting rooms, and then you would have had your own, you know, private sitting room that's right off your boudoir, which is where the lady, you know, would have gotten dressed and would have seen her closest friends and her family members. Since, as you know, at that time, it was still popular to entertain your clo your closest friends and relations while you were having your hair done by your maid, right? That showed that you were all friends and you would have coffee or tea while your maid was finishing up your hair because God knows it took you four and a half hours to get ready every morning and you change clothes three times a day. So uh, this is where we see her. You notice she's got her red rose here, right? And this points upward to what's on her mind. Um, you know, this is the story of the 19th century, the Biedermeyer outlook on the role of women, right? A kinder, a kuka, kirka, right? Which is child, church, and kitchen, right? These are the main focus of a woman of this class, and this is what she's expected to reflect and what she's expected to be concerned about. Um, she is wearing a lot of elaborate clothes and expensive jewelry to reflect the wealth of her husband and of her family. So she's not really necessarily dressing as we do today for comfort or self-expression, right? She's, uh, she's dressing kind of as the face of the family's success, the family's wealth, and what she wears says a lot about the family's social position, not so much about herself. So this is very important to note when you um, look at her. But if you look at her table, you notice that she doesn't have um, red roses there, she has white roses. And you know, there was a complex and elaborate language of flowers uh, in the 19th century. And so uh, these white roses stand for innocence or for hidden love. So you know, she's a lady who wants passion, but all she has you know, on her table is hidden love or, you know, even uh, pure innocence. And this goes back to the idea of the pure, you know, Madonna type womanhood. So I think Chiro illustrated that really beautifully and really subtly uh, when he did um, that we have red and white roses together, of course, uh, is another indication of Chiro's updating, right? Chiro moved these cards to Victorian England and red and white roses, of course, are a long, long, you know, symbol of England. So um, that's another, you know, hint that these cards have been moved to, to Victorian England. So in the opposite sex reading, right, she's the, obviously the partner of Kipper 1, the gentleman, and in the same sex reading, I make her the partner of Kipper 12, uh, who's known as the rich young girl, or as I like to call the great beauty. Um, you know, so um, that's just, again, a, a flexible moment. I don't think that using uh, the mature lady, the, you know, the older wealthy lady uh, is, you know, it's never really worked for me. It's not very useful. It doesn't, you know, necessarily flatter my clients. So I, I just like to use, you know, Kipper 12 as the partner for this in an opposite sex reading. All right. So then let's go ahead and talk about um, card number three. Now, 
you know, in the 19th century, what you did, if you're of this, you know, haute bourgeois, grand bourgeois social class that we see here, you know, in the Kipper deck as the protagonists, right, you were still presented with a narrow range of possible suitors who were approved with your parents, by your parents, and then, you know, you got married. <laughs> so, you know, unlike uh, stories that we're used to today where, you know, you have like, me cute, love, lose, get back, happily ever after at the end, right? You get married first. Sorry, that's just, you know, the way it was for people of this class at this time. So this is why Kipper number three is marriage, right? Um, so there we are. Uh, this is a very, very positive card, right? So as you can see, it depicts an idyllic wedding in a fairy tale type country church, right? It stands uh, for a literal wedding, particularly when it's with the magistrate, Kipper 30, or and or a good match, the card I call a good match, Kipper 15, which Chiro calls lovers. Uh, but it's for any kind of close contractual, contractual relationship or partnership. It can be a joint venture you know, something like that. Uh, and it can also stand at certain times for a super tight best friendship uh, in an abstract manner, right? And a psychological manner, because, you know, Kipper does have this psychological component that we don't find in the Lenormand so much, um, is that it can represent any joining of forces, you know, or joining together or, or you know, melding together if you're talking about ideas or, you know. So just kind of keep that in mind, right? It's not as literal as marriage, like you might see in a Lenormand reading. It, it has more, more nuance, and it has both the literal and this abstract psychological level, which we always should take into account, to my mind, when we read the Kipper. All right, so let's go ahead to the visit, courtship, right? Of course, this is like the main thing that people of this class did all day, right, is they just went visiting. This was very crucial to keep up your social uh, connections through this uh, method of formal visiting. As you can see, um, Chero here has uh, depicted literally a kind of a courtship in a garden. Uh, there was an enormous body of etiquette surrounding proper visits and uh, proper courtships. So here you can see that the potential couple is wearing a morning dress, not morning as in sorrow, but morning as what you wore before lunch, because remember, you change your clothes at least three times a day, if not four. Uh, and they're seated in a restrained and proper French garden, which gives the whole thing an attitude of formality, of strong etiquette, of restraint, right? And uh, you notice that uh, Cupid's bow is unstrung here. He hasn't, he's got no arrow, he's not hitting anybody. So uh, nobody's in love, right? Nobody, nobody's been hit by the arrow. And this is a, a big difference, say, between the tarot, you know, card, lovers or choice, right? Where you often see that you know, the, the Cupid's arrow is strung and he's about to whack somebody with it, but we're not in this situation. Uh, so this card represents social life, all kinds of personal and business meetings, arrangements, clubs, groups, and even just a, a friendly hangout. Okay, so I just want to kind of say that. Then here we have the mature man or the rich good man, right? I like to call him the Baron. Again, I do that simply to help uh, contemporary sitters, you know, the people I work with, better understand the social classes that are, you know, um, depicted in the Kipper deck. Uh, since people are so familiar with the Victorian time from, you know, watching BBC TV and Downton Abbey and all of that, it's just useful to use the actual kind of um, figure that is meant to be represented by the card and what it brings to mind, right? So even though it's not the literal German translation or it's not what, you know, Chiro may have called it, it's just sort of what the figure is and who he is and that helps clarify the meaning of the card and his position among all of the people here, right? So you can see that we meet uh, the, you know, the Baron, an honorable man. He's sober, he's thoughtful. Here he is in his day his day suit, right? He's sitting in his library as opposed to a study. So this is a man who is uh, very well disposed to you. He's on your side, and so he stands for all kinds of bosses, guides, authorities, and executives, as well as important male relatives, such as grandfathers, uncles, fathers, stepfathers, fathers-in-law, godfathers. Uh, if he's close to you and without bad cards, he's definitely supporting you. 
right? He's going to help you out. You can turn to him for advice and networking. But if he's far away, if he's behind you, or if he's with the false person card, remember the false person has the ability to turn cards to their opposite, uh, then he's a challenging figure. He is the um, abusive father. He is the boss who stabs you in the back and takes credit for your work. So, you know, you have to look very carefully in the kipper when you when you see what what cards next to him is he you know uh, behind or in front of or near to you know the main person card so just kind of you know look for that um, and uh, so you know there we are now let's talk for a moment about the situation of <clears throat> infidelity or adultery uh, here's where we get to the novelistic aspect right so if we have uh, card number one you know and card 13 as the same-sex couple what happens if you have cheat and cheaters in a same-sex situation in which case I tend to use him as the third wheel the other guy uh, the cheat and cheater so um, this is just how it works for me. You should experiment and see how the cards work for you. You may want to reverse them or change them. You know, you'll know best as uh, your readings play out, but this is just how I, how I do it. All right, so then let's talk about the good lady, the mature female, who I also call the barrenness, right? Uh, let's take a, a look at her. Um, she is a lady of a certain age in a very elaborate day dress. Right, and she is sitting, as you can see, not in a boudoir or a private sitting room, but in a salon, right, in a formal salon here. And um, she uh, is, you know, represented by a fully open rose in the original version of Chiro's drawings, but then in the final drawing, Chiro, I guess, took the rose out, uh, maybe so that it would be less confusing. Uh, when you're looking at the grand tableau so you wouldn't mistake this for card number two, keeper number two, the lady. Um, I'm not sure why, um, but you know when I look at this card because I had, I've had i seen the drafts of Cheers card I always think of her as a fully open rose that indicates her advanced age and that she has had a family and she has you know achieved the blossoming of her life. Um, so of course she's the the you know compatriot or partner of card number five the baron so as a result she stands for your grandmother your mother your stepmother your mother-in-law aunts godmothers female fit authority figures executive guides and teachers and just like uh keeper five the baron you want her it close to you or in front of you if she's far away behind you or with the false person um, again, she's going to be a, a, a problem. Right? She's, she maybe is not well disposed to you anymore. Maybe she's your the difficult relationship you have with your mother. Uh, maybe she harangues or lectures. It, you know, just just a negative and challenging relationship, particularly with Kipper Eight, the false person. Uh, in uh, same sex and opposite sex affairs, both. I use her as the other woman, right? Again, so if we're talking about, you know, cases of infidelity, I always use her as the third wheel or the other woman. You may disagree. Again, experiment and see how it works, works for you. Now, let's go ahead and talk about this card, seven, the message or letter. In German, this is originally a pleasant letter, right? A very important thing to note about this letter is that it has been received, it's opened, it's been read, but you also notice there's an envelope in the drawer which has not been sent or has not been read. So you see that there, there's kind of two messages here and you can depend on the context of the reading to see how you want to interpret uh, these two cards, you know, these two separate meanings. Maybe somebody gets a message but they haven't replied or there is a second message that you know they haven't gotten or but anyway you know, just depend on the context of the question and how the reading goes to see how you want to uh, interpret this but this is definitely uh, a message that has been received in Chiro's intention uh, and which is a little different than the original German card which shows an unopened envelope on a tray um, but this is a uh, good news unless it's with challenging cards uh, with difficult cards, right, the, such as, again, the false person, which would have the ability to turn this card to its opposite. And um, if you are looking below it, right, in a large spread, you may look at, you may find something that you're in denial, something that you don't want to hear, and that may refer to 
the envelope that is closed here. So what we're looking at right now is a writing desk with this lovely antique brass phone, a dip pen, and a heavy crystal inkwell. Uh, the the telegram, um, you know, it's really it's a telegram right here. So it's a you know it's a quick message, and then uh, we see all the other kinds of communication on the desk and around the drawer, as I said before, a, a business or calling card, a folded letter. So it, it stands for all kinds of messages and communications, phone calls, texts, emails, letters, documents, notes, papers. And also, because it's the seventh card, a lot of people use it to mean seven days or one week. So this is our first instance of time, of the highly structured time that we find in the Kipper, and I just kind of want to point that out to you. Okay, let's move on then to one of the most interesting cards, I think, in the deck, the false person card. I also call this sometimes the two-faced gossip because, you know, that's what, uh, that's what she is. She's the, the carrier of tales, the frenemy, the backstabbing person, the insincere, the flatterer, right? Um, so Chiro has illustrated this as a sly and evasive woman who hides her real expression behind her Spanish fan. And then at the side of the marble hall, outside the ballroom, so to speak, there's this mysterious and sinister looking guy in a fancy dress mask. So this is how we know there's some kind of fancy dress ball and they're wearing costumes. So they're not authentically themselves, right? Um, there's a strong feeling that they're up to no good, but at the same time, maybe they're just, you know, playfully being the devil's advocate or, you know, being the villain. So this is the kind of thing, again, you have to really look at the cards and read them very carefully and follow the whole story, the whole chain of cause to understand how serious this card is, right? Um, so in the most serious form, right, it's a drama king, a drama queen, it's the people who love trouble, manipulators, in a lighter sense, it's the frenemy. This is, you know, definitely you should watch out, but the intensity of the danger depends on if, you know, where, how the card is situated and what house it's in when we read the Grand Tableau. So, you know, watch, watch out for that. Don't overplay it, right? Don't be catastrophic. Don't ca catastrophize unnecessarily. And, and try to use placement and house and the cards around it in context of the question to you know judge and gauge the seriousness of this. And this takes a little practice, but you know you do have the ability to do this. As I said before, this also has the ability to turn quote unquote enabling or good cards to the opposite. All right. So also watch out for that meaning. It may not mean deception in and of itself. Right. It may be negating or flipping the meaning of another positive card that's touching it in any direction. So, you know, watch out for that. Again, when you're actually doing the reading in the context of the question, as you're, you know, as you're going through carefully the, the whole long storyline that you can get from a Kipper deck, the meaning of it will be obvious in context. Okay, but you know, it could mean treachery. There's no doubt about it. So let's talk about this card. This card means change. Okay. This is definitely all kinds of changes, though it can also apply to moving, as literally as in moving house. So uh, this card shows that it's time to go. You know, you make a decision and you gotta go, right? So this card, uh, specifically as Chiro has illustrated, it shows a porter, right? A hardworking moving guy in his flat workman's cap, and he's packing up the gentleman and lady stylish furniture. Uh, into their new horseless carriage, right? This is how wealthy these people are in Victorian times, in late Victorian times in England. They already have a horseless carriage. So they're, they're wealthy and they're moving up. They're moving to a bigger house, right? So generally we kind of understand this as a positive change, right? Um, and you don't plan to come back. This is a one-way move and this is something that distinguishes it from the next card, 10, which is journey, right? So if it's with like card, card 21, the living room or drawing room, or the card Kipper 20, the house, you know, this is literally a change of, of residence, but it may also mean that you need to make a decision or be adaptable, be flexible, adopt more uh, open outlook, prepare yourself for unexpected changes. So again, in the context of the question, these things will um, all become clear. So uh, let's go ahead then, sorry while I pick up this other card, and let's move on then to journey, right? This is the actual trip. You notice that um, it's usually depicted as some kind of 
you know, carriage in the traditional, in the quote unquote traditional Kipper deck, right? It's a carriage while you're going on your way for the season to the spa town of Simbach on the border to Austria, right? Because you're going to take the waters there, right? Which is what people did when they would come from Munich and then it was time to, you know, during spa season to go to the bath and go drink the water and, you know, relax and cure yourself in the fresh mountain air with the, you know, pure or mineralized water that had, you know, mysterious healing properties. So, um, Chiro, of course, has updated this card um, to a, a late Victorian uh, kind of aspect where we're going to take the steam train. We're going in that direction. So if you want to know what the journey is towards or the journey is for, look to the card over here, right, where the train is going right and this is where you've come from and this is where you're going uh, and this is what you're thinking about it and this is what you're trying to hide about what you you know where you're going so you can use the directionality uh, in this way right you notice that uh, in Chiro's illustration of it we've got a first-class carriage from Victoria Station uh, and you notice that the figure who is traveling is uh, you know, Kipper 13, who I like to call the millionaire or the rich man, right? He's got his high top hat. Um, but, you know, Chiro extends the metaphor of the cards here, I think, in a very positive way by having also visible the second class people farther down the platform, right? So, you know, you see our, our friend, the millionaire, with his fine leather luggage for first class, but he's still riding the same train. He's in the same society. He's in the same world with the people of second class. All right, so Kipper 10 stands for all forms of transit and vehicles, vacations, travel, escapes, round trips, right? As I said, this is what makes it different than card 9, Kipper 9, which is a one-way trip. You're going up. This card, you're going forward and you're coming back, right? So as I said, then use the directionality of the trains to see where you're going and where you're coming from. Okay, let's talk about card 11, jackpot, winning money. Winning lots of money, right? As you can see, uh, Chiro calls his sudden wealth, and you can see he has a, a casino, a one-armed bandit here, a slot machine kind of thing, coming up all sevens, and the money is, is coming pouring out. So this is, again, a reference to the trend that developed during the, the late Victorian times of going to the quote-unquote casino for fancy gambling, to show off your clothes, and to meet other people of your social status. Uh, so this is uh, literally the lost check that shows up. It's a monetary gift, the larger than anticipated tax refund. Bingo, right? You, I mean, you completely understand what this means, right? If it's close to the significator, it's a large sum. If it's with the false person, however, it could actually indicate a money loss, right? Or not receiving the money that was due to you. And if you have the false person card next to it and it's close to the person, it means that you could really, you know, be severely harmed financially by, you know, this event. Maybe someone actually steals a large sum of money from you. Maybe you, you know, lose the inheritance. Somebody snatches the will that was in your favor. You know, however you want to kind of understand that in a novelistic um, context. Also watch out if it's near the thief card, Kipper 24, right? But this card also in a description, if you're pairing it with other cards, this card can also mean many, much, or multiple. You'll see as we go through the Kipper deck that we have these paired cards, such as we have a pleasant letter, we have an unpleasant letter or a message of concern, we have a card that means many, we have cards that mean few, and as we go through that I'll kind of, you know, like you know, show this and discuss this. So you can be sure to get the descriptor cards, you know, as they're useful for you. All right, so let's move on then. I don't want to make this video too long and we're already past 30 minutes. To uh, Kipper 12, this is uh, the privileged lady, as Chiro calls her, the rich young girl. Uh, originally, she was a convent girl. Uh, in the original Kipper deck, you see her in her post-convent clothes. She's a debutante. She's come out and she's getting ready to get married. But see, see Kipper shows, um, Chiro's Kipper shows an older, an older girl. You can see she's extremely wealthy. Uh, she comes from, you know, the highest class, dressed in the latest fashion for the Victorian era with lots of ruffles and elaborate feathers. So she's the, um, the height of wealth, ease, youth, health, beauty, charm. You see her strolling past 
her, her enormous lawn in the orchid house on a beautiful spring day at her country estate, right? She's just lavishly, lavishly dressed. She's the best dressed of all the characters uh, in the deck. And she looks out at us like, aren't I so fantastic and don't you know it? I mean, she's just, you know, one of these ladies who's used to admiration, used to always being the center of attention. So this has both positive and negative aspects, right? We can see that this card, uh, you know, abstractly stands for fun, creativity, luxury, beauty, the good life, all beautiful things, right? Uh, she can also be the best friend of the Lady Kipper 2 in, in opposite se sex readings or the partner of the Lady, as I said earlier, in same sex readings. She is the counterpart of Kipper 13, the millionaire. So she can also be a younger female relative, a niece, a younger sister, or a half sister. She can be a daughter or a stepdaughter. The idea is she's a person who's a little bit younger than uh, card number two, the lady. Uh, she can be a cousin or even a bridesmaid, right? But do watch out if she is with the false person because then she becomes a mean girl, right? And she's filled with snobbery, vanity, disdain, cluelessness. And with other challenging cards near her, she can be wayward, headstrong, stubborn, right? And represent those characteristics. So uh, do look out for that. Then let's go ahead to the card, the, uh, the wealthy man, the rich young man, or I like to call the millionaire, right? Uh, so you see him uh, in his office, right? Unlike the study or the library that we see in the other uh, male cards, we see him in his office. He's a business guy. You see him with his stock ticker, right? He is there at the end of the successful trading days. You can see he's picked up his hats and he's about ready to leave in the tipper tape. The ticker tape has been run out, so it's not the market open, it's the market closed, right? Uh, he, uh, if you want to know kind of what his business is like or what his business is about and how it's going, follow the ticker tape, right? So the ticker tape is where it's going, this side is where it's, you know, this side is the, was where it's going, and the start of the stream is where it's come from, so you can see the flow of the business and what the business is about right? But now he's he's going to his club, right? It's the end of the day, so he's got his hat, he's, and he's running off like Bertie Wooster to his club, right? So he is, again, the counterpart to the great beauty, Kipper 12, the rich young girl. So you can think of him as a venture capitalist, a banker, a financier, or even in an abstract sense, your startup company. He stands for your career success, your business acumen, your smart plans, your excellent calculations, your rational thoughts, and a well-calculated risk. He's well disposed to you, right? And he will grant you access to the old boys network if he's near you or if he's in front of you, right? In opposite sex situations, as I said, of adultery or infidelity, he's the other man. And in same sex questions, as I said, I like to use him as the partner of uh, Kipper One, the gentleman, right? Uh, he can also be someone who's a little younger than the gentleman. So he's going to be a son, a brother, a stepbrother, a cousin, a nephew, any kind of slightly younger male relative. And he can also be the best friend or best man of the gentleman according to the context of the question. Again, if he is next to the false person, though, watch out, right? Because it could be the situation that you know you're in a ripoff, that contract is not so great. Be sure to read the fine print, double check your plans. You know, and if he's also with other challenging cards, look for bad career news, bad office politics, and again, arrogance, right, abuse, condescension. So, you know, look for that. Now, uh, since we're already nearly 40 minutes in, I'm going to stop right here. Uh, one third of the way through the deck. As you know, Chiro's deck does have 39 cards. And so I'll make a couple of other videos trying to do 13 cards at each time. Uh, but I want to thank you for your attention. I hope you found this helpful and explanatory. Uh, if you have any questions about anything I said here, please don't hesitate to contact me on social media. I'm always happy to talk about Chiro's deck. It was such a uh, great fun to work on that. It was such a privilege. And the continuing support and positivity I've received from the card community leaves me still to this day just in a lot of gratitude. So thank you so much for your time. 
and enjoy your Kipper deck. You can still buy them from Chiro. I believe he still has them from sale. So if you don't have them yet, go ahead, run over to his site, chiromarkitty.com, and pick one up. And until I make my next video in another couple of days, have a great day and enjoy your cards.